Hey guys, it's Dr. Justin Marcajani here. Really excited to be live with you all today. Uh, we're going to be chatting about low digestive enzymes. Why do you have low digestive enzymes? We'll kind of break down the physiological imbalances that's driving that and things that you can do to kind of get on top of that. Uh, before we do, we're also live on Rumble today. So if you guys want to watch me and some other channels, I'm putting some exclusive content up on Rumble. Um, Rumble.com slash Just in Health is a great way to access that information as well and to engage with me on some of these live videos too. All right, guys, so we're going to talk about enzymes today. Put your comments below. below. Let me know your experience using enzymes uh, to help improve your health. So out of the gate, enzymes are really important. They help with different processes in the body. A key way you know it, you're dealing with an enzyme is you have the ASE at the end, whether it's lipase, that means you're dealing with fats or lipids, protease, typically protein, and you have things like trypsin or chymotrypsin. These are kind of protein digesting enzymes. Then you have things like amylase, which are going to be more on the carbohydrate side. And enzymes are really important. They're there to help speed up essentially chemical reactions in the body. In this analogy, they're breaking down protein, fat, and carbs, breaking them down. And so what does that mean? Protein, hunk of protein. Imagine it's like a pearl necklace, right? Each little pearl is a peptide. So you're breaking down those proteins into peptides so you can absorb it. Similar with carbohydrate, you're breaking up those chains of carbohydrate. You're breaking up the fatty acids. This is so they can be absorbed in the intestinal tract and then they can utilize these nutrients for neurotransmitters, for recovering muscle tissue, for connective tissue, for the lipid bilayers of the cells cholesterol for your hormonal building blocks. So there's lots of raw material building block that these foods are essentially needed for. So really important. We got to have good enzyme production to, to, to help with this digestive process to break these foods down into their smaller constituents. Now, st the stomach area is where everything starts. That's where we need a nice low pH, that nice acidic pH, two or three, one and a half to two and a half or so on the pH scale. So seven is about water, right? And then you have one is pure acid, Eight starts to becoming more alkaline. So we're dealing with something more on the acidic side, one and a half to two and a half or so on the pH side. And where our body is taking, it's pumping in these protons, hydrogen, and adding chloride to it and making hydrochloric acid. And hydrochloric acid, what it's doing is lowering that pH, that nice low pH. It's important because a lot of these enzymes are pH sensitive. So they're not going to activate unless we have nice low pH. Now, if you're taking Tums, if you're taking uh, calcium carbonate, if you're taking Prilosec, what's that doing? Well, that well, one, it's either providing an alkaline compound that's raising the pH up. Think like baking soda, which is the pH of 11. Or think of uh, Omniprazole, right, or Prilosec. That's blocking the proton pumps from pumping out hydrogen. So it's preventing that acid from forming. And so that takes the pH where it should be around two and it brings it back up. What happens now? Now you're not going to be able to activate a lot of those proteolytic enzymes. The big one is pepsinogen, which is in its inactive form. Remember, it's not an enzyme uh, until it has that a the ACE next to it. Pepsin, I guess, kind of the exception. Pepsin is, I, I would say it's in the protease family, but pepsin is a proteolytic enzyme. So that's in that protein family. And then you're going to have a lot more proteolytic enzymes and I guess we call it protease, if you will, right? Proteolytic protease. So pepsin's in that big protease umbrella. And so if we don't have that nice low acidity, we're not going to activate pepsinogen into that protease enzyme. Very important. And so when people are giving acid blockers, they're kind of weighing two sides, right? One side is that low pH can be a little bit irritating. That acid can be a little bit irritating to the gut lining. So if you have that gut irritation, I can give you this omniprazole, Prilosec, Nexium, block those proton pumps, block those hydrogens from bonding to the chloride and bringing the acid down. But then now you're going to have crummy digestion. Now you're not going to break that food down. You're not going to ionize those minerals, um, displace the charge of those minerals so you can absorb them. Now you're not going to break down that zinc. You're not going to break down the magnesium. Now you're probably not going to break down that protein and fat and cholesterol as well. And now you're going to be set up for other potential problems because you need these building blocks to run your neurotransmitters, right? Your brain chemicals are made from protein. Tryptophan is precursor to serotonin, 5-HTP. GABA is a really important kind of uh, amino acid kind of based neurochemical that's an inhibitory compound. Tyrosine is a building block for dopamine. Theanine plays a major role with GABA and relaxation as well. So these are really important. Um, this is a beta endorphin is a 19 amino acid compound. Beta endorphin is kind of your natural pain reliever. So these are really important 
compounds to help our body be healthy, help with pain, help with inflammation, help with mood. So it's very important we have good acidity. So acidity is the first step for good enzyme production. We need good acid to stimulate the enzymes. Remember, the enzymes won't work unless we're in a nice acidic environment. So good acidity. If we don't have acidity, we could be in this fight or flight state because our body shuts off digestion. It shuts off secretion because it's shunting blood flow and resources to the arms, to the legs to fight and flight, uh, fight, flight, or flee. And so we have to get more parasympathetic. So anything we can do to relax the adrenals, whether it's breathing, meditation, appreciation, um, good sinus breathing, good healthy anti-inflammatory foods, these put us in a parasympathetic state, which then allows that blood to say, hey, we don't have to mobilize blood to our muscles and our arms to fight and flee. Let's bring it back to the core. And now our juices are flowing. Now we can start to make that good acidity. Now that we have more juices to lower that acidity, that pH. So low pH equals high acidity. So they're kind of opposite things. So if I say low pH, that's acid, low pH, high acidity. Okay. So don't get confusing. That's going to raise that acidity, lower that pH. So that's going to start to activate the proteolytic enzymes and get the digestive cascade moving. Now, also, we have other enzymes being produced down the track. So we also have things like our proteolytic enzymes being made by the pancreas. So we need that nice low pH in the stomach. All that food that's mixed up is now called chyme. That chyme gets released into the small intestine. That triggers a release of bicarbonate by the pancreas, which is essentially baking soda. And that brings that pH back up to seven so you don't get a peptic ulcer. And that works on the stimulation of the pancreas to make a whole bunch of proteolytic enzymes, proteases, that's protein digestive enzymes, uh, lipolytic enzymes or lipase, that's fat digestive enzymes. And most of the carbohydrate stuff's going to happen more in the mouth, maybe just a little bit in the stomach. So not as much on the carb side in the small intestine. Gastrin also plays an important role in the stomach, typically with, with uh, acid secretion as well. Um, so that's, that's kind of the big step there out of the gates. You really need that good, good hydrochloric acid, good enzyme. We have to make sure the adrenals aren't overstimulating. You have to make sure you're not doing things that are driving you, driving inflammation in the body. Inflammation in the body at micro levels can create a fight or flight response. So if you're eating foods that are allergenic, that's a problem. If you're making your blood sugar go up and down, too much carbs, too much processed foods, too much flours, too much grains, too much inflammatory fats, that could create a trigger, a, a little bit of a fight or flight state in the body. And so you have to be aware of that. Obviously, also, if you have a chronic inflammatory state from infections, that could be a problem. If you have a chronic inflammatory state from mold or mycotoxins or a toxin in the environment, whether it's heavy metals or pesticides or Roundup or glyphosate, these are all kind of various vectors of inflammation that could be putting you in that fight or flight state. So you want to be a detective of all kinds of inflammatory inputs, and you want to do things to really open up that parasympathetic, whether it's appreciation, meditation, good, clean, inflammatory food, anti-inflammatory foods. Um, sometimes even fasting can be helpful, especially if you've been eating a whole bunch of inflammatory foods, just resting the, the gut can be helpful. Again, there's no magic in fasting because eventually you need to you'd go back to actually eating the nutrition that's going to sustain your body. So if you're going back to junky foods, then you're not really fixing the problem there. And some patients, their guts are, their adrenals and their blood sugar are so wonky and so inflamed that they have a hard time fasting and that can be a stressor as well. It's like someone that's very obese and having them exercise, even though exercise is good, it may be too much and make their body so inflamed now they're in pain. So it's kind of like that. It's definitely still a stressor. So you have to look at that really holistically. All right, guys. So I hope you enjoyed today's video. There's some other factors that could fit into the mix here. I won't go too into depth. I'll just kind of outline briefly. H. pylori is a big factor in the stomach that can lower uh, the hydrochloric acid levels, i.e. bring the pH up and can also decrease enzyme levels as well. You can have other gut bugs, bacterial overgrowth, SIBO, fungal overgrowth, and that can lower your enzymes, lower your hydrochloric acid levels. The easiest thing out of the gate is get your gut looked at, get your adrenals looked at, work on the good foundational diet and lifestyle strategies that are going to help with the inflammation. I have a lot of videos on the channel on this topic on health and nutrition that can be helpful to work on some of the things I've kind of already outlined briefly. But again, gut bugs can be a big deal, whether it's parasites, bacterial overgrowth, fungal overgrowth, SIBO, kind of dysbiosis, those kind of all fall into a similar umbrella. You want to look at getting those done. Look at the stress handling system, the adrenals, see how out of whack those are. And then you can also look at nutritional deficiencies, whether it's neurotransmitters or important B vitamins or important minerals that are important for stress relief and good, healthy cognitive uh, function as well. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, thumbs up, comments below. If you want to reach out to myself, 
uh, available for patient support worldwide. I have some staff that will be able to help you out. We see patients all, all over the world, and we try to get to the root cause of what's happening with their health and really make sure we're using functional medicine philosophies, principles to build up a solid health foundation when we get to the root cause. So feel free, there'll be a link down below where you guys can reach out. Hope you enjoyed today's video. Subscribe so you can get access to more content like this and be on some of these live calls. All right, guys, take care. Have a good one.